can go. Um, but uh, welcome everybody. Uh, so exciting to have you all join us uh, for uh, the start of this webinar series on social movement ecology. Um, we're really excited because we think this topic is really important for our, our movements, um, reaching more and more complex levels of engagement and collaboration, reaching higher levels of scale and, um, and crafting sharper strategy. And this is actually part of a process. At the end of this year, we're going to be putting together a four-day uh, training all on movement ecology. And so these webinars are, are a chance for us to, to practice material and put it out there and get some feedback and, um, and see what resonates, what works, what, what, what isn't working. And so it's important to us um, that you all have you know, taken the time to join and, and, and participate in that. And we we'll really look forward to, to, to building this out with you all. Um, my name is James Hayes, and I'm going to share my screen and so we can get started with the, uh, with the webinar. All right, awesome. Social movement ecology. Um, and like I said, my name is James. I'm uh, the training director at the INE Institute. We're sponsoring this, uh, this movement ecology webinar series. Um, and the INE Institute uh, exists to build community around new understandings or technologies that are going to bring about a more balanced and reciprocal world. Um, uh, INE actually means reciprocity in Quechua, which is the language spoken by the indigenous people in the Andes. Um, and that's uh, really what centers, um, drives a lot of our work. And we work around three pillars. Um, memory, uh, we think it's really important that to, to look at our past and our history and learn lessons from our ancestors that we can, that we can bring forward in today. Um, we also work, do a lot of work on alternatives and figuring out how can people meet their needs in, in, in new ways outside of the state and outside of the market. Um, and, and figuring out how do we strengthen those alternatives. And we also uh, do a lot of work around, around movements. Um, and and in, in, in movement ecology is really in the center of all of this um, and has come out of, of a lot of the work that we've done. So we're really excited to bring it to y'all. Um, I'm James, like I said, the rest of the training team, and I'm gonna let them introduce themselves right now. Paul and Sophie, do you guys wanna say who you are? My name is Paul Engler. I'm one of the lead trainers for INE Institute. I'm also a co-founder of the Momentum Training Institute and the community and nonprofit that I work for is called the Center for the Working Poor. Uh, and that's an intentional community in Los Angeles. And I will be your co-trainer uh, today on this webinar with James. Hi, I'm Sophie Lassoff. Um, I am a research assistant for the social movement ecology training uh, that we're putting together. Um, and I'm a newly trained trainer with Momentum. Uh, and I'm really excited to participate today um, and help out with technology and supporting our fabulous trainers, Paul and James. Awesome, all right, thank you both. Um... And, and really just briefly tonight, uh, just you know, going to give you a quick overview of what we're going to cover. Um, some of you who might have been in momentum trainings in the past, you've seen that you've seen this material before. There's been, you know, there's always things that are being updated and tweaked and, and, and reworked. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, this is a chance for us to take that material and go even deeper. And tonight we're going to be covering what are some different approaches to creating social change. Um, there's you know, so much diversity uh, in there. And. We're going to talk about how do we, how can we understand and appreciate these different approaches and traditions for making change, and in, in hopes of building new relationships. And we're also going to talk about what is movement ecology. Um, we, you know, as when we launched this, we heard that a lot. Like people are interested just in that metaphor of ecology and ecological thinking. Um, and so we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight as well. Um, and then in the second webinar, we're going to we're going to go a little bit deeper in, 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 into all this material. Um, but before we do that, I'm going to pass it off to Sophie to talk to us a little bit about the technology we're going to be using tonight. Yeah, so um, typically we really like to make these workshops um, very participatory, but obviously it's a little more limited when we're online. Um, but we're going to try our best to adapt with the tools that we have on Zoom. Um, so I'm going to show you all a few features that you'll need to know about um, while we go through the webinar. So the first thing um, is the screen view. So you're probably seeing the, the slideshow as your main view right now, and maybe you see my face um, in the top right corner in a little box. And if you just start to click to toggle between the different screen views, 
um, see if you can toggle to uh, gallery view where you see everybody's faces. Everybody can start to wave at each other and you can scroll through and see people's faces. Hi everyone. Awesome. So um, when we do introductions and things like that, we'll want to use that view just so you can see each other. Um, and then the, the second thing to do um, is to go down to the, to the bottom panel and click on the little chat box. So we already started using the chat box and people already started talking through there. Um, but this is gonna be our main tool for participation during this webinar um, so that we avoid people jump talking over each other. There's 20 people on here, so um, we wanna make sure it's manageable um, and we wanna prevent echo. So we're gonna stay muted for most of the time except for our trainers. But we really, really, really encourage participation through the chat box. and. There's going to be times when we prompt you to answer questions, um, and we'd love your participation during those times. Um, but also, we don't want you to leave us feeling alone, lonely. Um, so we would love um, to get some resonance via the chat box. Whenever you hear something that resonates with you or that excites you or you learned something new, um, we want you to put three exclamation points. So I'm demonstrating that right now, like this, if something resonates with you. And you can feel free to do that at any time. So everybody practice right now doing three exclamation points. Awesome. Look at all that excitement. That's making me really excited. Cool. Um, and so just to be sure, if um, you want to make sure that your chat is going to everyone, you can also send private messages if you want to like gossip to someone behind our backs, if, if that's what you're feeling like doing. Um, but the, the main thing that we want to do is send a message to everyone. So make sure that, that your little um, your little chat box is pointed to that. Um, and then the last thing that I want to go over um, is the mute button. So on the bottom panel again in the bottom left corner there's a button for mute and unmute and so you can don't practice it right now but you can unmute yourself at any time. Um, while we're presenting please stay muted um, and if for some reason you accidentally uh, unmute yourself and there's a bunch of background noise, then I as the host might mute you. Don't be offended if I do that. Um, but there will be uh, one point when we're all going to unmute ourselves and actually get to get to talk um, besides doing intros. Um, so that's a button you need to be familiar with. Um, and then we're also, I just wanted to make sure everyone knew that we're also recording uh, the webinar. So if uh, you're like scrambling to take really quick notes or something and you'd rather just experience it as it comes, know that this will be available on YouTube um, after the fact. Awesome. All right, cool. So we're gonna um, jump into introductions. Uh, we wanna know who's joined us here tonight. Um, while I have the screen shared, I actually can't see any of your faces, which is Unfortunate, but it's exciting to hear that there's 20 people with us tonight. Um, so we're going to ask you um, to take 30 seconds to share uh, your name, uh, like your location, like where are you where are you at right now? Uh, what movement and organization are you part of, and like what's the role that you play in your movement? Um, we're talking a lot about diversity um, of ch approaches and different you know ways people are talking about making change. So we just want to know about what's some of the diversity that we have here in the room. Um, so Sophie, can you help facilitate this? Yeah, so I'm just going to call on people. I'm going to do it in alphabetical order because that's what I see on my on my sidebar. Um, so I'm going to call on you um, and you can unmute yourself using that little button on the bottom left. Um, so Adam Greenberg, why don't you start us out? Adam, are you there? Uh, he says, frozen screen for a minute. Come back to me. Okay. We'll come back to you then, Adam. Uh, Anna, Ruben, go ahead. Hi. 
Hi, can you hear me? Yep. I have a lot of background noise. You may be able to hear some steel drums. This is random. Um, my name is Anna. I'm sorry, I forget the questions, but I'm with If Not Now um, Chicago. Um, and I'm part of our movement ecology team. Um, and I'm very new to movement ecology. So I was just really excited to be on this and learn. Um, was that questions? Great. That's, That's it. Great. Thank you all. Awesome. Arielle, go ahead. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, my name's Arielle. I am in DC right now and also repping, if not now, DC. Um, and our role in that, if not now's role in the larger Israel Palestine anti occupation movement, I think is um, around like aligning the left on, on a certain strategy and um, yeah, trying to reclaim what it means to be Jewish um, and, and changing our American Jewish population's um, support of the occupation into one of not supporting occupation. Awesome. Thanks, Ariel. Uh, Avery, you're up. Here, Avery, I just unmuted you. Oh, okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Avery Ains. I'm with Sustain Us, and I am tuning in to just, yeah, I'm really unfamiliar with movement ecology, really interested to know more, specifically how it pertains to, like, Sustain Us leadership development and our, like, structure going forward, um, and looking forward to taking this into other aspects of different movements that I'm involved in as well. Awesome. Thanks, Avery. Uh, so Chris is, is joining us um, via the library. So Chris, I'm gonna spare you from having to introduce yourself. Um, well, Chris says this, hello all, I'm Chris Moore. Oh, there he is. Backman listening in from Chico, California. Lots of experience in movement to end mass incarceration and producer of a radio documentary series, Bringing Down the New Jim Crow have a book coming out next month called Gandhi and Iceberg, the Nonviolent Mass Manifesto for the Age of Great Turning, trying to rally folks in the movement of movements with a force enough to turn this sucker around. Also involved in international peace teams, working with Christian peacemaking teams in Hebron, Palestine. Nice to meet you all. Great to meet you. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Um, <laughs> and... Sean is excited about people being together offline. Um, cool. So, uh, LT, where are you at? Hi there. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, my name's Lisa, um, and I'm in the Boston area. Um, right now, I'm working with Surge in Boston, and so I'm really new to movement ecology and just interested to hear and learn more about it. Great. And just to um, keep things quick, we'll just make sure people introduce uh, their their name and um, if they have an organization or movement that they work with. You don't have to go into why you're here or anything like that um, just yet. Uh, so someone is on an iPhone, titled iPhone. I don't know who that is, but if you want to chime in. Hello. Hi. Uh, this, hi. Um, uh, my name is Diego, and I'm from uh, Homestead, Florida, and I'm currently working with Cosecha. Awesome, thanks, Diego. Mm -hmm. Isaac. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Cool. Uh, yep, my name is Isaac. Um, I'm in the Boston area, and I um, am with Surge, showing up for racial justice in Boston, and also with the uh, ARC, an anti-racist collaborative, which is out of the humanist hub in uh, around the uh, out of Cambridge. So nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Uh, Jay Berkman Hill. Hi, my name's Julia. Um, I'm in New Haven, Connecticut right now. Um, I work with the Divestment Student Network and If Not Now, Boston. Awesome. Thanks, Julia. Jesse, go ahead. 
Hello, Jesse here. Um, come to you from Oakland, California, and I'm um, national staff with Jewish Voice for Peace. Thanks, Jesse. Kendall, go ahead. Hey, folks. Um, I'm calling in from Portland, Maine. I work for 350.org um, and a part of the climate justice movement. Awesome. Thanks, Kendall. Hey, Kendall. And Liz, go for it. Uh, my name is Liz Pilato. I am in Oakland, California. I'm part of the climate justice movement. I work with the Sierra Club and I am um, a trainer. Great. Thanks, Liz. Matt. Hey, my name is Matt. Um, I'm in the Boston area as well. Uh, I've done some work with, if not now, Boston. I'm also with a couple of friends. Um, we have a sort of new uh, anti-racism group in Cambridge and Somerville called Cows. Uh, and I also work on a thing called the Honk Festival, which is a sort of festival or movement of uh, activist brass bands. So a lot of sort of music and uh, performance art for social justice. Awesome. Awesome. If not now, people rep in. Um, Prentice Haney. Hello, Prentice. Uh, I'm from Dayton, Ohio, and hey. part of OSA, organized OSA. Mm. Uh, my role um, recently just came on as the communications director, so trying to build Ooh. communications infrastructure for OSA. Sweet. And Rachel, go ahead. Hi, um, I am in New York City. Um, my name is Rachel. I am um, part of the Divestment Student Network, and um, I'm working mostly on campuses and working with the Responsible Endowments Coalition. Thanks, Rachel. Sean, uh, not Sean Estelle, but the other Sean. Yeah, and the other Sean is actually Lydia. I don't know why my screen says Sean. <laughs> uh, so this is Lydia. I'm in D.C. Um, part, I consider myself part of a lot of different movements, but I guess my job has me in the climate movement, specifically working with youth, um, the executive director of Energy Action Coalition, soon to be Ooh. Power Shift Network. Thanks so much for joining us, Lydia. And Sean Estelle, the true Sean. <laughs> Great. Uh, hi, y'all. Uh, my name is Sean Estelle. I'm in Chicago, Illinois, uh, and I'm the national network organizer with Energy Action Coalition, just soon to be the Power Shift Network. Um, and yeah, work nationally with students and young people in the climate justice and youth movement. And Silver, go for it. Um, hey everyone, I'm Silver. Um, I'm in the Bay Area in Berkeley, California right now. <coughs> I have to cough. <clears throat> um, I'm part of the fossil fuel divestment and youth climate justice movement and I'm a campaign coach and trainer and mentor in that movement. Awesome, thanks Silver. Sophia. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yep. You're on mute now. Okay, we can hear you now. No, we can't hear you. Uh, can you hear? Yeah. Yep. Go ahead. Okay, sorry. Um, so, organized this with my mom, Justice, in the Divestment Student Network. Currently, though, I'm abroad in Rio de Janeiro and working, um, reporting on different social movements happening here, um, organizing around the Olympics and things like that. Great. Awesome. Thanks, Sophia. And just two more. Taylor? Hey, guys. Uh, yeah, my name is Taylor. I live in Boston. I mostly worked on issues of corporate accountability and money and politics, uh, primarily through a group called The People, which um, grew out of Moved Women. Uh, but I found my way here. We got kind of cut off, Taylor, but that's... I think we got, we got the bulk of it. Okay, we got it. Good. Awesome. Victoria, last but not least. Hey, I'm Victoria. I'm in the Bay Area in California. I work for the, um, in fossil fuel divestment. I'm also a coach um, and help coordinate the Escalation Corps. I'm happy to be here. 
Amazing. So many amazing movements represented here. Thank you all so much for, for bearing with that lengthy process, but I think it's really awesome for us and for all of you to know who's here with us today. Yes, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, it's so exciting to be on, the, on this webinar with so many talented people. Um, so let's just move forward real quick. Um, and since you all introduced yourselves, uh, we want to make sure as a training team that we introduce ourselves to you. And so in this webinar, I'm going I'm I'm to tell you a little more, more about myself and, and, the, and the next one, Paul is going to take a turn to tell you a little more about himself. Um, but yeah, so I, like I guess my name is James Hayes. I'm uh, born, raised, and currently live in Columbus, Ohio, where I grew up with uh, uh, my two younger sisters, Grace and Hannah. Grace is the youngest one there. Um, and my parents, uh, Bill and Suzanne, um, who uh, were really, were really awesome. And, um, and, and, and they're the reason this, you know, my family, particularly my mom, is the reason that I organize. And, and honestly, as I was reflecting on this webinar, um, is the reason why this material in particular uh, resonates with me, um, is important to me. Um, you know, I grew up, uh, because of the way they were, I was just always in and around the community. Um, you know, they were always going to meetings, school board meetings, neighborhood, you know, association meetings, this and that. Actually, my, my dad likes to tell, he likes to tell people um, when, he, when he meets, when, when I introduce him to people, that my first uh, full sentence was, I want to go to meeting, uh, which is pretty embarrassing. Um, <laughs> I, I, always, I always follow it up by telling people that that will certainly not be my last full sentence, but, um, but it definitely, you know, that was the type of household I grew up in and, and the type of example that they set for me. Um, in the type of neighborhood that we lived in, you know, I, I grew up in a neighborhood on the Neary side called Old Town East. It's a historically black neighborhood. And uh, it was a great place to grow up. Um, but, you know, in the 90s, it was going through a lot of the, a lot of the same challenges uh, that black neighborhoods across the country were going through as um, the war on drugs was increasing and mass incarceration and over-policing uh, was continuing to rage on. And um, I saw all that growing up, you know, and I saw... Uh, families that you know, lived on my on my street and on blocks around me, leaving you know, moving to the suburbs and and uh, you know my family we stayed uh, for a long time. We stayed. Um, my my mom had a had a real deep attachment to the neighborhood and to the community, and and she she actually ended up becoming a pastor in the neighborhood at um at a church down the street from where from where we lived called Old First Presbyterian. Um, she became a, a lay pastor. She never actually went to seminary, but but this is a very really small church and. Um, and, and she was all they could afford. Um, they were happy to have her and she was, she was really happy to have that congregation. And, um, and, and, you know, being there, uh, was interesting. Uh, you know, her, her sermons, you know, you know, people have this idea about church and her, her she was a different type of preacher. Um, her sermons were really just like diatribes against the Iraq war, um, and the Bush, the Bush regime. And, um, and she was always in the community trying to start different projects, uh, you know, I, uh, I became an organizer because she was always, always an organizer. Um, one of the, one of the best projects that she got started was, uh, it's called uh, the Four Seasons City Farm. It's, is a community garden project. And, you know, a lot of people in the community had noticed this need, uh, that there weren't any grocery stores. Um, there were only corner stores that had, you know, chips and, uh, soda and candy and people couldn't, you know, walk somewhere to get fresh produce very easily. Um, and so people decided, hey, let's let's start a let's start a, a community garden. Um, this is a picture from one of the little gardens. And in the first year, they ended up, uh, or first couple of years, they ended up, you know, expanding to having eleven gardens uh, across the city. Um, and we're really doing a, a lot of amazing things. Um, in the summer, I had kids in there learning how to, you know, plant stuff and grow stuff, and uh, and, and, and a, a beautiful community uh, started coming around um, around 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 the gardens and around the church. Um, and then, you know, when I was 16, everything changed, uh, uh, when my mom, she was diagnosed with cancer and that was, um, you know, she, she, had, she had dealt with, uh, illness before, um, and, and had health, had, had had health troubles, but, but we knew from the beginning that this was going to be different. Um, this was going to take a lot more out of her. Uh, this was going to be a lot more threatening and, um, you know, the community, you know, really rallied around her, but. Uh, you know, two years later, after I graduated high school, she, uh, she was in hospice, and um, you know, and and that year, you know, it was a it was a year of a lot of lessons for me. Uh, it was 2008. I was 18, um, and I had uh, been swept up. I was very excited about uh, Senator Barack Obama, 
I was knocking doors and talking to people. I remember the hardest person for me to convince to vote for President Obama that year was my mom. She, she, uh, she said to me, he's a centrist, he's a moderate. Uh, how, can, how can I have raised a centrist? And she, she said, and, um, I, but I convinced her uh, to vote for the president. Actually, the last thing that she ever did, um, she cast her absentee ballot to vote from her bed in hospice. Um, but, you know, during those conversations about, about politics um, that we had, especially in that year, and, um, and just all the lessons that, you know, she has shown me growing up, but, you know, but, but particularly those conversations about, about, about the president and about, about the, the hope and the change that I wanted to see. Um, and, 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 and as a few years were pass, has passed and I was in, in college and was starting to um, get involved in other sorts of things. And, and, you know, I, and actually it wasn't just me. I think, you know, you know, I started college in 2008 and in 2012 and, and in the fall of 2011 is when Occupy Wall Street jumped off. And I think the, you know, our whole generation had seen, um, you know, had gone through this period of disillusionment and realizing that we couldn't just, you know, vote somebody in and expect things to change. We actually had to get involved and get active and, and build and uh, organize and protest and, 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 and make our voices heard. And, and, you know, I was learning the same lessons and reflecting on, on, on what she had told me. And that's so why I became an organizer uh, on my campus. Uh, involved in a, a lot of different things, um, involved in stuff, and, you know, we started a couple of newspapers, uh, we were involved in Occupy, we ended up starting a group um, out of the Occupy movement called uh, the Ohio Student Association, which um, you sort of Prentice is the communications director for now. So um, it's been going on uh, for over four years now, and it's really exciting um, to see where it's at today. Um, but one of the things that happened when I became an organizer is that I actually distanced myself from some of those things that my mom had been involved in in the community. Um, you know, and it wasn't intentional, you know, in, in, the, in those years in college, I had actually joined the board of the community garden, the Four Seasons City Farm. And, uh, you know, the garden was going through a tough time. After my mom had passed, it was, uh, it was, it became really hard for the garden to, you know, find uh, the leadership it needed to, uh, uh, to, you know, get all, you know, everything together. The, you know, the next ED, that, or the, someone, you know, the next ED that they, the board had put on had, uh, um, you know, messed up some grant paperwork and lost a bunch of money. You know, there's a bunch of stuff going on. And they asked me to join the board, and, um, and I was happy to. Um, but one of the things that happened as I became, started organizing was I started learning that, um, that there's a difference between um, organizing for power um, and doing other things like community gardens. And I actually made a decision to step back from the garden and focus all of my time into building an organization, uh, focus all my time into building power. And, um, and you know, I'm, I'm very happy that I made that decision, um, but there's been, there was pain from it in, in that moment. Um, and it's a tension that I saw then, but I've also seen later on in the organizing. I did a lot of work, or I've done a lot of work, I still do a lot of work around uh, criminal justice reform, mass incarceration, and police terrorism in, our, in black communities, black and brown communities. And, um, and you know, it's particularly in the movement to end mass incarceration, I saw it's, this tension play out where, especially folks that were coming out of prison and were organizing and, and were trying to figure out how to build a, a movement of returning citizens, a lot of folks wanted to, wanted, the first thing that they really wanted to focus on was building uh, mutual aid services to help, you know, when people come out, help them get back on their feet, help support them so that they can, you know, organize. They're saying people don't have, have the time. And, and, and I've been, I was in meetings where organizers tell them that's, that's not organizing for power. That's not building power. And, and I've seen people leave. I've seen, and I've seen organizations split over, and, and leaders leave organizations o o over these tensions. And, and so when I, when I went to my first uh, momentum training, and in uh, and, and January 2015, and we went through this moving to college, this moving to college module, I, I thought to myself, this is, this is really important. And this is something I actually immediately brought it back to the, organi you know, to the organization I was in and the, the set of organizations that we work with closely to share it with them. Because I thought, you know, this is, this is a really important framework for, for understanding these tensions. And, um, and I thought about it again uh, just a couple weeks ago, a month ago, actually, because the, the church that my mom was pastor of uh, decided to... Uh, dedicate uh, the first garden right outside the church to my mother, and um, and it was a really beautiful time. I hadn't been back to that church in a number of years. Um, it's been a number of years since I, you know, I really haven't gone to church since she passed away, um, and uh, and so I, I was there and with my family, uh, a bunch of my friends came, and a lot of people from the church, a lot of people from who participated in the garden, some people who also hadn't been there in years, they came back too um, because you know, of how much my mom meant to them, but how much, you know, those times that in that community meant and that garden meant to them. And I was reminded again in that moment, uh, you know, how much power there really was, how many, how many, how many resources there were in that community. Um, and, 
and what a shame it was that I couldn't really tap into that when I, as I was organizing and building um, and building what I was building in, in Columbus. Um, so yeah, so I'm really excited for the, for, for this because I, I think it can help. Uh, it can help a lot of people uh, who've had tension and even had pain around these tensions um, come together and have to have a, have a new conversation about how do we build new relationships between different approaches and theories of change. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it off to Paul to uh, take us and into our, to our next section. Our next section. So this training we do at the beginning of all momentum trainings um, and momentum training is a training that we developed, which is a three to four day training talking about some of the basics of how to build popular mass protest movements. It's primarily focused around that. But the first thing we realized before we even really start doing training is we need to set up a container to be in good dialogue. And what we realize is when people come to trainings or they're coming to webinars, a lot of times the first thing they're thinking is, is this gonna to apply to me? And whether or not I should endorse this or not? Is this good or is this bad? Does this apply to me or not? Is this part of my politics or not? And actually, we don't want you to do that. <laughs> We're not here to get you to endorse us. Um, we're, we actually want people to slow down and really um, think about a process of going through understanding first, just understanding what we're saying and understanding the concepts, then appreciating the value of those, of those ideas and how they can be applied, not necessarily to your own context, but to other people's context, other people's experience. Then maybe after that, there can be some experimentation. Now on webinars, there's very little experimentation, but sometimes people in their brain will start thinking about how this could apply. And that's, that's partly how people go through a process of trying to integrate whether or not they can actually take it and use it in their organization. Then after you experiment or try things out, then you, you can endorse. And we recommend you slow down and go through that process. But really in this webinar, we want you to focus on understanding and appreciating and sort of suspend some of the, uh, especially endorsement for later so that we can enter into better dialogue. Because when people think they have to endorse, they're not actually understanding or appreciating. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. So as we move forward, um, we're going to start in, in by saying that, you know, as there's so many different cultures and organizations and theories of change, there's a, you know, a vast diversity out there of, of, and, and within that, you know, there's been developed traditions, you know, and, and, you know, people have a lineage of thinkers and writers um, that they look to. And so, and, and, and so, and so, so there's, there's, there's a lot of diversity out there. Um, and as, as we move around within our, within our respective traditions and, uh, and, and theories of change and cultures, um, a lot of times we're kind of like fish in water. Um, and there's this quote that we like to, we like to use you know, as we really think about how do, how do we start to just really understand and appreciate. Um, and we say, you know, we don't know who discovered water, but we know it wasn't the fish because they're just in the water. You know, it's so unremarkable to them. It's so... Uh, it, you know, it's so it's so basically they take it for granted um, that it's even there um, until they get pulled out of the water and then they can see that there's water. And that's really what we want to do right now. Uh, we've all been in organizations and in struggle and in uh, operating as, as, as leaders and activists and organizers. And um, and so we, we want to take a second where we can just pull ourselves out, out of that stream. And, and just look at the, at the water we're in and also some of the other streams and, and, and rivers and, and whatnot that's out there. Um, but out of all the diversity that there is, out of all, you know, uh, out, of, out of everything that's out there, there's a lot of ways you, you could try to uh, systematize that or arrange that or break that down. Um, we've, we've chosen to break it down uh, into b three basic approaches to social change. These are, these are three big buckets um, that, we, that we think uh, sort of encapsulate um, all, the, all, all the diversity that's out there. And you know, I want to say within these buckets, there's a lot of diversity as well. Um, and so the, the, three, uh, the three basic approaches that, we, that, we, that we're presenting are, um, one is personal transformation. Um, another is building alternative institutions. And the third, uh, but certainly not the least, is changing 
challenging, overturning, um, you know, whatever verb you want to put in there, the dominant institutions in our society. Um, and, and, and like I said, within each of these, there's a lot of diversity about how people actually go about doing these things. Um, but we're going we're, we're gonna to take a second to, to go through each of these right now. And then after that, we're going to have, we're gonna have a, t a chance for some questions. But as we go through this, um, if, if anything's coming to you, you can feel free to, to write a question. And we're going to take a breather after we get through these, uh, after we get through a couple slides, to, to harvest some of those questions. Um, and, uh, and, and, then, and then we're going to talk about some more examples. So I'm going to pass it off to Paul to talk a little bit about alternative institutions right now. Well, first thing, before I go into alternative institutions, you go back to the other slide. There's two things I want to mention. First thing is that um, we're making these buckets, but in time with advanced movement ecology, we're going to break up more and more what are the different theories of change and organizational cultures that people are coming from. So we can get more into the nitty gritty of, for instance, in changing dominant institutions, there's a lot of different theories within how to change dominant institutions. Um, whether it's mass protest movements or lobbying are both in that theory or that bucket. And the second thing is that these are approaches of social change. So when we ask people, how are you changing the world? How are you creating social change? These are the three types that people think about, oh, I am trying to change the world through personal transformation. I'm trying to change the world through building alternative institutions. They might have a different vocabulary for it, but all these people are trying to create change. Now, there are people that are defending the status quo or don't even see that they're trying to create change. Those people don't fit in what we call the movement ecology. It's people that actually think that they're creating change or self-identify as change makers. Awesome. So the first, yeah. the first uh, distinction is what we call alternative institutions. And there's a lot of different uh, theories about basically how do we prefigure the world we want to live in? How do we actually embody and create an alternative culture or an alternative institution that is actually the revolution in the here and now? What are the changes that we want to create in the here and now and create that alternative as a way to create social change? And one of the mottos of this from an IWW song is to build a new world in the shell of the old is one of the mottos of this theory of change. And there's a lot of different things that fit into this. One would be, for instance, people who are interested in alternative uh, uh, banking, like uh, cooperative banks. They're trying to create new models of banking, new corporations or, or new types of ways to uh, cooperatives of participating in the economy. There's people who, um, in throughout uh, the history of uh, religious movements, a lot of this has been in the monastics. So uh, monasteries are like trying to create a parallel um, world that has a different way of functioning with the economy, with people and the rules of how they interact in a gift economy, whether it's a Buddhist monastery or a Christian monastery. The idea was that we, you know, we're in some ways creating a parallel universe uh, away from the world to model what the spiritual life that we ideally believe is is the the best or most pure yeah and 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 something you know that came up has come up a lot in some of the conversations that other examples of this you know might be countercultures artistic movements um you know like punk in the 80s or hip hop uh you know coming out and and really trying to you know challenge the the dominant culture by creating an alternative culture you know we know, you know some things can be co-opted um uh, but yeah, all this goes into alternative institutions bucket. And um, as we talk about dominant institutional change, uh, there's a lot, like we said, there's a lot of diversity in this bucket. Um, some, you know, things that some, some typical activities around community organizing and community based organizations or labor unions, um, which are looking to, you know, put pressure on local, you know, politicians and corporations and the bosses. And, you know, so, some of the mottos, you know, that we hear a lot are like educate, agitate, organize, uh, the Ola Belinsky motto. Um, there's also social movements uh, like the Black Lives Matter um, movement that is, you know, really polarizing the country right now um, in the streets right now. There's a picture from uh, Baton Rouge that was really uh, inspiring um, the other day. And, you know, also, but also like political parties like the Working Families Party um, or even, uh, even folks that might be like Bernie Sanders, you know, who's trying to change things, you know, within the Democrat, within the Democratic Party. Um, 
and some you know other slogans that we hear you know, like things like "Be the Power," which was the uh, dream one of the Dream Defenders slogans. You know, not just um, you know building something outside of the power, but actually being that thing and taking it over, um, you know, making it your own, so that so that you can wield power and you know stand up, fight back, uh, things like that. Um, Paul, did you want to add anything uh, before we move? Well, on? this theory of change is primarily how do we change the dominant institutions that most people participate in. So what are those dominant institutions? They're schools, they're corporations, they're uh, the government, they're political parties, um, they're, they're the legal system, they're, sometimes there might be standard nonprofits, they're churches, right? They're any dominant institution that people are playing, that are participating in, which a majority of Americans participate in a lot of them. Um, and movements that are financial institutions, like uh, universities, are all part of that. Uh, so and it's how we reform them. And there's many ways to reform them. There's many ways or to try to, to, uh, to, to engage them in a way uh, whether it's reform or or overthrow them, but that would be if you're engaging with the dominant institution, that it fits in this theory of change. Awesome, thanks. You want to take us away with uh, personal change? So personal change is you personally be the change you want to see in the world. The theory of change is that how you ch you change yourself first, and then the world will change one individual at a time. So. Uh, there, any theory of change where I'm going to change the world by just influencing that one person. And the great metaphor of this, I don't know if you've ever heard this story told many a time. Uh, it's been told, it's called the starfish story of uh, one time an old man was walking along the shores of the sea and there was, the tide had brung, brought up millions of starfish that were dying on the beach. And he bumps into a child who is frantically throwing starfishes back into the ocean, trying to save them. And the old man says, why child, why are you trying to save these starfish? There are way too many starfish for you to have any impact. You're not making a difference. And the, the child says, well, it made a difference to that one starfish. Right? This is a metaphor for how a lot of times people think in this theory of change. And so if you want to get examples of that, it would be like, for instance, service providers. A lot of times service providers are um, like people like are doing mentoring um, or even doing yoga. What they're thinking about is how do we create social change for the person that I'm providing services to or trying to change them one at a time. Um, there obviously there's some overlap with alternative institutions. There's a lot of different overlaps. We're going to get into that later, but people who are really, uh, rigidly in this idea is really just thinking about the individual. So there's mentoring 12 step program is a good example of this, right? Taking people through recovery and creating change through trying to, to, uh, support people to, to overcome their addictions or compulsive, uh, behaviors to become healthier. Yeah, and so we're going to take a, a breather here. Um, uh, actually, everybody could just breathe. Let's take like a, a, a deep breath in. And let's take a deep breath out. And um, I don't know if any, I can't see the chat box because of my screen share. I don't know if any questions have popped up, but this is a chance. Um, if you have any questions or any insights, things that have resonated with you about the theories of change, we're just going to stop real quickly. I don't know if there's anything quick that, 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 that's come up for folks. Um, before we move into uh, mapping them out a little bit more. So we just want, if you have any questions about the three distinctions, now is the time to write it in the box. And we're going to go and really analyze these three different approaches and map out a little bit about what are organizations that you're participating in in your life that fit in these approaches. But first, we really want you to understand is it, if you have any questions about understanding those three approaches, uh, any questions about that, please write them in the chat box right now because we'll respond to them. If not, that's okay, we'll move on. But anybody have any questions, write it in. 
Okay. So it looks like we're, we're doing good. It seems like people understand the approaches. Um, what time does this go to? That's a really good question. So we're trying to do an hour and a half to two hours with all the participation. So we started, um, about six we started at three. Oh, we started at, at uh, so three o'clock. I'm on uh, Pacific Coast time. So the world revolves around me, not you. And therefore, uh, it will end uh, at five o'clock our time. So another hour and 10 minutes. Um, but ideally, we would, we would end earlier uh, and take questions. All right, so now we're gonna we're actually gonna map them out, and in the in the module that we do um, at the momentum training, and you know if we were all in the same space, we would have you get up out of your seats and move around the room and you know, do a lot of fun stuff. Um, we're gonna try. It's the first time we're doing a webinar, so it's not gonna be as uh, engaging and exciting, but uh, but hopefully we can try to recreate that. Um, so bring some energy. Um, but so we're so what we're going to do now is we're going to talk we're going to go into each one of these buckets and we want you to just think about what are the examples that you can name all the organizations and specific like organizations or movements or the specific examples within the within these uh, this theory of change. And so we're going to start with alternative institutions and feel free to just start typing it in the chat box. We're going to start harvesting it. Um, but we've done this before, and so some of the examples that have come up in the past are things like the Malcolm X the Malcolm X grassroots movement, which is um, you know, doing a lot of work at looking at looking to build alternative uh, ways for people to relate to each other in the in, in the in, in, uh, in through economics and also um, alternative ways to do democracy, uh, things like democracy now, which is the best alternative news. Uh, what you say? One second, James. So what I need is okay. So when we do this exercise, okay, this whole exercise is based in some ways. We want you to map out. We want you guys to really think. The question here is, what are organizations that fit within, basically fit within this theory of change, this approach, and uh, we want to understand and harvest from the group. So when we do this exercise, in some ways, we, it's a collective exercise at mapping out what are all the things in the movement ecology that fit within this approach. And we're going to use that later on in our webinar, but we need your help to make this better. So we need you to write down right now in the chat as we're going to, we're talking about examples of alternative institutions, but we really need you to be writing in the chat. What is in your movement ecology? What are all the little examples of organizations that fit primarily in alternative institutions? Yeah. Thank you for that. So, so yeah, I don't know if any, I'm going to read off a couple more. Just stop me when, when people start uh, sending in stuff. Um, one of the other examples that has come up a lot is Bitcoin, uh, which is an alternative currency. Um, Countercultural movements, like so, this way with a picture like from Woodstock. Um, I, I, Paul, is there anything coming in the chat box? Yeah, Montessori schools. That's a great example. Alternative schools, food cooperatives, great example. Credit unions, uh, political third parties. Yes, all those. It's a great example. All right, awesome. Worker co-ops. Uh, city bike co-ops or rich city rides is an organization that uh, Silver mentioned. All great examples. All right, awesome. Thank you all. Um, and the same thing, just you know, start throwing out different examples um, of groups that you know, fit in this bucket uh, for challenging the dominant institutions in our society. Um, we already talked, you know, there's like popular movements like Black Lives Matter, Cosecha. Uh, there's movements here that are here on this call. There's a lot of people that are engaged in this um, in, in this work. Wait, just one second. We could go back just to alternative institutions because it's yeah, yeah. so we got communes, intentional communities, community land trusts, limited equity co uh, cooperatives, community owned solar gardens, freedom school movement in Western Massachusetts. Those are all perfect examples. The only one I would really add is countercultural stuff. So. A lot of artists are, some artists are really interested in personal transformation. Other, so hippies is a great example, like that's a counterculture, so people try to embody a different culture. Arts and craft movement can, yeah, that's a good example. But the um, people who a lot of times are artists are in the counter, the alternative institution because they're in the counterculture, and some of them are actually trying to uh, do more personal transformation and you can tell by the artist about how they think about their art 
transformational festivals, tiny house movement, bread and puppet theater, all perfect examples. Great. All right, cool. And so let's do the same exact, uh, same exact thing. Fire them off as quick as you can. Um, examples for folks that are challenging the dominant institutions in our society. Um, and we talked a little bit about the movements. There's community organizing networks like PICO or NPA, National People's Action, or political parties. There's a lot of diversity within this, within this field. So what are some examples that are coming to y'all? Boycott, divestment, sanctions. That's a strategy to do dominant institutions. Great one. Um, somebody asked, why is there not a third theory of change? And I actually think that's a really great uh, question. You know, later on, we're going to break them up into more and more complex theories of change. What we learned in pedagogy is that you have to start simple and then complexify. So um, we, we alternative institutions and cultural change for us is one approach. And then later on in advanced movement ecology, we're going to break up theory of change more into into more smaller buckets and stuff. But at first, I think it's really helpful for people just to have a basic understanding. Um, so there's lobbying, a lot of lobbying organizations or DC groups that are trying to advocate things in DC. Uh, James, you, you can go on. Go on. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I can see the chat box. So yeah, just let me know when, when it's time to well, You can give more examples of. Uh, oh, family. give more examples. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, the, like we, you know, I think on this call, I heard, you know, if we have if not now on this call which is a movement popular movement uh organizations like 350.org the Ohio student association there's a lot of a lot of organizations that i know of and you know know people in that are on this call that are engaged in that type of work um i think within this there's also uh you know individuals you know i think there's organizations there's also people you know like i think like a, people that are trying to run for office i think would fall in here um though you know sometimes they're not always um, you know, and we, we have to, we have to do a lot to, you know, to make sure that they're doing the right thing. But, you know, I think the Bernie Sanders campaign has been, um, has shown that, the, that there's, you know, can be really effective at, ch at challenging the dominant narrative institutions, um, to, you know, to do different things. Uh, it's been a, you know, a tough week lately, but, um, but it was really inspiring, uh, for the last year. Is there anything else coming in the chat box? Yeah. So labor unions are most labor unions. Uh, believe that they're trying to reform corporations or they're trying to fight for workers' rights and um, higher levels of, of equity. And so therefore labor unions would fit within that theory of change. Organiz organizations fighting for community rights and institutions surrounding it. War tax resisting, uh, tree sits, plowshares. You know, some of these distinctions have to do with whether or not people are actually trying to change the dominant institutions or whether or not they're doing their tactic um, as an expression of their counterculture. So, uh, you know, sometimes you don't know based on the tactic, you kind of know based on the theory of change. Um, so, but all those examples, all those could be definitely examples that fit into that approach. Is it safe to move forward? Yes. Awesome, thank you everybody for your participation. Um, yeah, and so in our in our last um, bucket, um, you know, and definitely the same thing, just fire, fire them off. Um, but in the personal transformation bucket, some of the organizations, we've got three listed here, so we would love to have more um, examples from y'all. Um, we already talked a little bit about uh, AA and 12-step programs. Um, we have here a group from uh, Milwaukee called Urban Underground that does a lot of youth leadership development and uh, youth mentoring and it's working, you know, one on one with a lot of youth and so setting them up and they're doing all sorts of activities. They're engaging in community organizing and movements and all, and all sorts of things and a lot, but, you know, for a lot of them, it starts, you know, in, in these types of programs. Um, we also have a, this, Paul, can you talk a little bit about gender somatics? And, and, and so gender somatics was uh, trying to basically bring somatic therapy into social justice work as part of an organizing culture uh, that helps do leadership development and trauma work with members, activists, and organizers within social change organizations. Um, so we also have uh, people talk about prayer groups. So a lot of churches uh, are trying to do personal transformation through spiritual practice. There's like meditation groups, meditation uh, retreats. 
political education and book studies, great example. The Big Brother program, great example. After school programs, prison reform programs, all those are great examples from the group. Awesome. Any others from the group? Okay. All right, awesome. Okay, now we're gonna move forward. Now that we have a, a sense of the field, so to speak, and we can see, you know, we see the chessboard and the different pieces. Um, I, we were playing chess, I think chess analogies are the, the best, but not everybody did. But now we're gonna, we're gonna move forward um, and talking about the strengths and weaknesses in each of these. Um, and so, just like last time, we wanna harvest a lot, uh, a lot of strengths and weaknesses from, from y'all. Um, and the experience that you have. So first, if you could just take it, take some time, we're gonna, in this bucket of building alternative institutions, what are some of the strengths of this model? Um, and, and then we're gonna go into some, into some of the weaknesses. Uh, and we facilitated this, this a number of times, and so we have a few things that have come up a lot um, that we've already listed out. Um, one of, some of the strengths that come up a lot when people, when we do this is that through building these institutions, you can model the world that you wanna see. Um, and, and also through doing that, you can decrease the dependence that we have on the dominant institutions to meet our needs, whether you know, that be the market or you know, reliance on the state, um, reliance on, uh, on, you know, on, on services and programs, um, and figuring out new ways for people to, to, to meet their needs. Um, but uh, what are some other strengths that come to you? Um, and write them down in the chat box. Is there, is there anything coming in right now, Paul? Yes, well, before I, I just wanna say, uh, when we do mapping, if we do it in a group, we can kind of see and harvest a, a lot of what is coming up in your world and how it applies, these theories apply. What, how does it apply to the people who are in your movement ecology? The same thing right now about strengths and weaknesses. We want you to give us, from your perspective, what do you think of the strengths and weaknesses? And when we do this as a group, it's really helpful because we can all learn from each other. So uh, one of the things that, th there's, uh, that people have been writing is uh, the strengths of alternative institutions and cultural change is a lot of times it's, it doesn't rely on the influence of funders or traditional funders, which are generally funding things that are more legitimate, uh, that are seen as more dominant or legitimate. That sometimes happens. Practice, uh, a lot of times it, it practices um, uh, democracy, equal rights, equal participation, or less hierarchical structures, or it, it, it it is actually practicing uh, different models of organization and, and practices. Um, um, so somebody, the, the distinction between alternative institutions and personal transformation is a lot of these, we're gonna deal with this later on in advanced movement ecology, but a lot of times uh, people who are doing alternative institutions are also thinking about personal transformation. This is true, there's an overlap, but the, the two, we're trying to make a distinction between people who are really, really thinking about actually building an alternative institution instead of doing personal transformation. And in our, uh, most people who, our experience who fit within those two approaches generally have different theories of change. Now, sometimes there is a, a synthesis. So right now, just for this purpose, we're just going to brainstorm and create that distinction and try to relate to the people that have a different theory of change in a different culture that they've built around that theory of change around just moving the individuals versus alternative institutions. Um, it's harder to market onto bigger media platforms. Well, so like um, it's harder to, well, that's, that's sort of on the weakness side, but is there any other strengths? We want strengths for, um, is there str str strengths instead of weaknesses that we of alternative institutions? Yeah, you can live the change and experience it. That's good. There's, it's a learning opportunity. It could be it could be research and development before we ask a dominant institution to change things. A lot of times, it's great to have an alternative institution. Like if we have food. Uh, uh, an alternative food system, then we can, it's easier then to, or, or we, we experiment with organics, we can push then for um, organics or anti-GMO stuff when we have an alternative that's already worked out. Um, and it can start small, so people can experience something uh, very small scale so that later on it could be scaled up in different ways. There's a lot of creativity about it. People have a great sense of community a lot of times through creating alternative institutions. 
Um, there, there can be uh, direct community investments. Mm. All these things are great. Figure out how to scale after, great. All mm. those are wonderful. Um, uh, the, yeah, I think all those are great, great examples. You want, we want to go into weaknesses now. Let's talk about weaknesses. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. So yeah, I get, just, you know, start, start listing them off. Um, you know, some of the one, the ones that we have listed here, just, you know, that this often happens, um, at a scale that's small and it doesn't, doesn't affect, you know, thousands or, you know, there's certainly not millions of people. Um, it's very labor intensive. It takes a lot of work, um, to maintain and sustain and, and build these models, even at a small scale, uh, a lot of commitment, a lot of skills and resources. Um, and yeah. And so, you know, just, it, it, it just takes a lot on our end to, to build and sustain them. But what are some of the weaknesses that are coming through the chat box? So we're talking about somebody said it's easily co-opted. I don't know if I've experienced it that much, but I think sometimes because they're in a small scale, they can be co-opted. But actually, I think a lot of times alternative institutions are harder to co-opt. Um, somebody says they're elitist. So it, it's a lot of times who has access to the alternatives is very limited. Um, and a lot of times that could be just white hippies or white, you know, the counterculture a lot of times can, can only be accessible to certain populations and sometimes that that misses out on more marginalized groups um, a lot of times it feels like it's it's not it can't go to scale or that we're not making changes that affects everyone or not changing things that are systemically uh, it doesn't address systemic uh, change um, in the dominant institutions um, it, and it doesn't feel like you can make the change at the scale of the actual crisis when you're just creating a little garden or you're creating an alternative school or alternative justice system. It's like the crisis is so much bigger than anything you can actually create at a small scale. And you're constantly threatened by dominant institutions. It's very hard to compete because even if you try to go to scale, it's very hard to compete against the dominant institutions that have more resources and legitimacy and, and uh, they, in the market, it's traditionally, um, there's a whole dialogue within the Marxist tradition about why cooperatives will always lose in the market. Uh, it's very hard for cooperatives to actually compete and scale in the market. And there's a whole bunch of theory about why that is because they don't have access to financial capital. They don't have, um, if, you know, they don't have venture capital. They don't have an entrepreneurial uh, uh, culture, you know, all these things that Gramsci and other people mentioned about the, what's so hard uh, for alternative institutions to scale. And they're constantly uh, threatened by dominant institutions. And they have a pure, a lot of times they'll have a purity culture that really isolates them from other people. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. And, and part of that, you know, that threat that is brought up for me, you know, how real that is, you know, I, a lot of times I, I hear folks like in this moment, in particular, people talking about, um, you know, in the movement for black lives, uh, we need to build alternative institutions, you know, economic institutions. And I think a lot about what happened to black wall street and how it was wiped out, you know, through violence or happened to move in Philadelphia in the eighties. Um, and so, you know, it's also the role of the state in, in shutting down these alternative institutions when they, when they start to become a threat. Um, is very real um but yeah let's move forward and or, or yeah those are all the weaknesses we've got so we can move forward into the next bucket uh changing dominant institutions um so same thing just jump into the strengths uh talk about the strengths uh, list them out fire them off some of the ones that come up a lot are that we can make you know really big changes that affect lots and lots of people um we can, you know, there's more, usually more access to money. There's you know, larger budgets in the organizations. And, and you know, really, really important that comes up and this is, you know, we can get to the root of power relationships and, and really shift those um, rather than just sort of like build, you know, you know, institutions to mitigate for the damage that's caused by capitalism or white supremacy or patriarchy. This is some of these systems of oppression. But what are some of the things that are coming through on the chat box? So we have... Uh well, we just want to talk about strengths right now of changing dominant institutions. People that we just identified that are trying to um, really work within the system. Somebody said more access to the media. They have more. Uh, they have more legitimacy because people are participating in those dominant institutions. So a lot of times, if you are working to change those things, you have access to that. Not all of these strengths and weaknesses apply to each each organization in the approach, but we're just trying to brainstorm what are general strengths and weaknesses. Um, 
So you can get concrete gains, and when you get concrete gains or pass, a lot of times it affects millions and millions of people if you can actually win those incremental change. You can shift the popular narrative, not just instrumental wins. True, that's true. And because you're trying to change the dominant institutions, a lot of times it's easier to polarize the public because uh, the, it's easier to get press or it's easier to build a popular movement around when your target or is the public or is the dominant institutions in the end. Um, so radical action to bring down systems of domination is personally and collectively transformative, yes. Uh, often lasting change. Yeah, if you change the dominant institutions, it's easier than the dominant institutions can, can embed those changes. Uh, and so uh, it can quickly build credible credibility with the public. Great, great. Um, there are well-established traditions within this. So there's, there's like way people know how to lobby. They know how to do public relations. They know there's a lot of community organizing traditions and there's even a tradition of popular movements that fit within this approach, within this theory of change. And so because of that, there, it's easy to learn certain models of doing this um, and that, that are well-established. Any others? Uh, any others? Good. Want to go to weaknesses? Yeah, let's move forward. Just fire them off. Um, some of the ones that come up a lot, you know, around the dependence on funders uh, that a lot of folks, especially in the community organizing, political party, um, you know, activities face. Um, uh, and these organizations can become disconnected from and even alienate some of the marginalized communities, sometimes even that they claim to represent and work for. There's um, a long tradition of popular movements and community organizing, and there's also a long tradition of poverty pimping in, uh, in the, the, not the, not the NGO world. So um, uh, there's some of that. Um, and they can be prone to co-optation and compromise. I think there's, there's a lot of examples of you know, painful co-optation and uh, compromise that undermines the movement um, in history. And I'm sure y'all can name a, name a bunch of those. But um, Paul, do you, want, do you want to take any more? or? or, or why do you keep on explaining them? People are put, still putting in weaknesses. People are still putting stuff down? Yep. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. And so some of the other ones that come around, there's this pressure to play by the rules, the dominant rules, you know? And so um, if you're engaging and changing dominant institutions and you're, and you're you know, uh, talking to, you know, there's, you know, in the Alinsky tradition, they talk about how an organizer needs to wear a suit and tie um, to, you know, to really fit in. If you want to be taken seriously, you have to wear a suit and tie and play by the rules. And, and sometimes you can't, uh, you have to make compromises on, you know, on how you personally want to show up in the world, but also on um, the things that you say that, and, the, and, and the activities that you engage in. Paul, do you want to say anything more about that? Well, I think co-optation is, 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 is played out a lot. Once you start playing within uh, changing the dominant institutions, then there, there's only a few avenues. And because of that, you're sort of limited. Mass protest movements have a way of of trying to change things that are a little outside of the boundaries of traditional change. But even then, somebody said, I thought it's often hard to sustain the momentum of mass protest movements or of movements and change uh, not, a lot of times it's not at the change we need in a lot of the approaches of changing dominant institution is so incremental and it's, and it's hard to believe that we, no matter how hard we try to influence the dominant institutions, it's so slow uh, the changes that we need um, that we need to make. Um, sometimes, when it comes to mass protest movements, uh, it's hard to measure some of that change. Um, if we're, especially if in the cult, if if we're trying to to change the culture, the mainstream culture, it's sometimes uh, challenging. Um, so, a kid, Chris said, such efforts usually play by the rules of the dominant system and seldom embody the spirit of the outcomes that you want to desire. I think that's a great comment. Uh, Victoria said, it's hard to see your wins and gains without legal changes or policies to point to, and it's hard to convince the public that what they're doing actually matters, um, not as materially beneficial to those that are suffering. Well, it, it, that can break both ways because sometimes compared to alternative institutional or personal transformation, it could be larger scale incremental change but on the other hand, incremental changes, um, there's not, sometimes there's not as material benefit for those who are suffering 
um, or it's not as intense for the people that are actually participating. It's hard for them to feel the depth of that, un unlike personal transformation or alternative transformation, which is super easy for them to feel something very concrete. Mm -hmm. uh, individuals get, get, can get targeted or um, attacked uh, be, because they're, they're fighting against the dominant institution. So there could be anti-union campaigns, or if you get, you're really successful, there can be intimidation threats, losing your job. Um, you can get demonized by the public for being po polarizing or disruptive or angry. Um, and also I think we said burnout, but I think like within this culture, because you're not embodying the changes you want to see, a lot of times we, we are participating in these dominant institutions that aren't nourishing to ourselves. And because of that, organizers and people who are, are, are real, the warriors or leaders, a lot of the leaders who are in this, these types of institutions um, are very unhealthy and they have, um, they have very little practices of self-care. These are all great, great comments. I really, uh, when we were doing this in the workshop, it's just really fruitful to get other people's analysis of this. Uh, and we were like, can we replicate this in a webinar? And I think people are doing a great job giving us material to talk about. Um, and we really want you, even later on, to really think about this. These questions are very deep. If you start studying uh, some of the deep theories about social movement ecology, um, within the Marxist tradition or the community organizing tradition or even in within our momentum uh, training Institute there's a whole dialogue that goes deeper and deeper about the systemic strengths and weaknesses of these approaches so um, and uh, and there's a lot of history that really talks about this stuff but I think harvesting from our experience is super helpful all right cool Yes, thank you all. This has been great. So we're going to move forward into the last, um, the last conversation on strengths and weaknesses and personal change. Um, so you all know the drill by now. Um, some of the strengths that come up a lot are that you can create deep and lasting transformational experiences in someone's life. And these are the type of experiences that, um, that are very meaningful both for uh, the person um, who's, who's having the experience and the, per and the person who's facilitating the experience for someone. So, and, you know, like we said in the last one of the weaknesses of, the dominant institutional change bucket is it can be hard to really feel the changes or feel like you're, like you're having an impact. I mean, this, you can feel it, um, you know, immediately and, and, and in a deep way. And through that, you know, it creates community. It creates a community usually around people that are trying to intentionally embody um, new practices and, and working on their own personal development, personal growth. So um, those communities can be very supportive for people. Um, you know, another one that comes up a lot is that, People say, you know, fundamentally, if people do not change, the world will not change. And so, you know, a lot of a lot of folks know by now that you can you can legislate a lot of things, but you can't legislate, um, you know, racism away. You can't legislate homophobia away. And 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 there's there's work that has to be done on the individual and interpersonal level, as well as at the systemic and structural level, um, to, to 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 bring about the changes that we want to see. Um, and last the thing that comes up a lot is it's R and D for movements, research and development. Um, so we can figure out you know, new innovations and how we can help people um, you know, not burn out essentially and, and, and work on their personal growth as they're, as they're engaged in movement work. Um, Paul, is there anything, anything that we need to add? People, uh, Sophie said that it's accessible to a lot of people who aren't necessarily political will get involved in being personally transformative. And that could be a gateway for, um, for participation in movements or social change in general. Um, somebody said it's healing. Uh, it can be very healing to the individual and we need that healing. It could be fun because we're focusing on the individual. It could be very immediate. We can feel the change immediately and the metrics for change because it's one individual is easier to measure. Um, we, uh, we can actually take capital from the dominant system uh, through it slowly. So a lot of times uh, this is a great, uh, I think, strength uh, that is uh, a lot of times we can use the dominant institutions and their resources to do services and stuff um, to, 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 to funnel it into this type of personal change, um, personal transformation. It's easy to control the outcome. It inspires others. There's low barriers to entry. All these are great examples. It can appeal to people across political and other kinds of differences because it's not systemic change. 
it's not only trustworthy basis for truly transformational change on the systemic uh, level. It's the only trustworthy basis for truly transformational change on the systemic level. What I think that Chris is saying, and I, I agree with him, is that a lot of times it, it's easier to trust people that are doing personal change and making personal transformation and seeing it embodied in their life. It's easier to trust than the intention that they're trying to go about on the transformational side or to see it in multiple people. Um, it's easier to trust and it makes people happy. Great. All these are great. And some of the weaknesses, um, and yeah, just feel free to f throw them out there. Um, some of the weaknesses that come up a lot of folks say, you know, this can be too individualistic. And so, um, you know, in that it can, it can actually, you know, you know, place the problems of the world on the individual and say, you know, you had, you know, you, you, if you change, you know, you can change uh, the, the world around you and, and it can avoid questions of system, systemic oppression and, and power. Um, it can also avoid confrontations with power, you know, seeking to, to focus on, on, on yourself and, 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 and within that, you know, we, we talked about how it keeps the illusions of meritocracy alive and respectability of politics. It can fall, fall into that. Um, sort of the soft side of the bootstrap argument. Um, and, you know, this often is fragmented and isolated from communities, uh, but, um, but, but, you know, but can also be very accessible to them at the same time. And, um, you know, and the scale is, is also something that we need to figure out how, how does it scale up in a, in, a, in a meaningful way. But Paul, what are some of the things that are coming through? So there's like spiritual bypass of people like all I have to do is transform myself and the world will transform. So it, it's not acknowledging any systemic uh, oppressions or, or how people get access to, uh, to personal transformation. It can be inaccessible to certain people or it can be really expensive. Certain types of, of personal transformation and change uh, are very expensive like yoga, uh, or certain communities, um, of, for instance, meditation retreats can be very expensive, um, not necessarily politicizing. So a lot of times people, it was exactly the opposite. It can blame the individual for systemic problems, like pull yourself up by the bootstraps instead of really, um, really acknowledging and understanding what are the supports that lift everybody up and what are what are the things that can scale or, or really create the change? It's a slippery slope into navel gazing, losing connection with oppression and oppressed people. Um, and it can be othering of other people. Great, great. You wanna explain a little bit more of that, uh, Kendall? But uh, you want any other examples? In the chat, go for it. Uh, but. I think with the othering, what the way I would interpret that is that there's a sense like, okay, you can make the, it's what we said is this can be too individualistic. It's like saying, okay, the, the, the foci of change is the individual. Therefore, if you are not the one who is creating individual change, it's your fault. So it's like blaming and othering other people and blaming people who um, a lot of times are marginalized or don't have access to the same levels of support. Um, can often lead to overemphasis on consumer action and actually enf enforcing consumerism. Great. I think our whole culture really is that I think the dominant narrative around change is actually personal transformation and change because it fits into a consumerist ideology or individualist ideology. Okay. All right. Awesome. This is amazing. Um, and so, you know, out of this conversation, I think, you know, we're seeing, I mean, I know I'm seeing some patterns and some, uh, it's, you know, that there's some compliment, there's, uh, that these things can complement each other. Um, but so often, uh, you know, these different theories of change, they operate uh, in antagonistic ways. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of conflict that happens between the approaches. And so we're, we're going to keep that, that conversation around the strengths and weaknesses of each in our, in our brains. Um, and we're, and we're going to, and, and we're going to, we're going to do this exercise. Um, that I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Sophie to sort of um, uh, faci help us facil help facilitate and explain what, what we're gonna do. Um, but but we're, we're gonna get a chance to talk to one another about what do these institutions say about the others. Um, we, all, we, know, we, you know, we know that there's a lot of shit talking that goes on um, between, between each. Um, but Sophie, why don't you take a second just to explain how the process is gonna work and how we're actually gonna do this. And Paul, if you, if you wanna add anything about, about what this exercise is. Yeah, so um, we're going to go 
into a uh, gallery view. Remember how at the beginning we sort of toggled around with our view mode so that we can all see each other's faces. Um, so go up in the upper right corner and um, begin to see each other and wave. And then I um, am gonna ask everybody who feels like they don't have too much background noise um, to unmute themselves um, and we're just gonna shout it out. But not uh, quite yet. I'm gonna explain the instructions and we're gonna go through them one by one. We're so, gonna go through one by one, but basically this is the only time during the whole webinar that you get to just like yell out without being called on or in the chat box or whatever. Um, because it's supposed to be, it's designed to be uh, very spontaneous and, and like we're getting our, our frustrations out. So what we're gonna do here is, it doesn't have to be necessarily what you say about those, those other approaches, but what we know is there's a lot of poop feet in the water, that, w that there's a lot of rigidity and people that fit in the water are constantly pooping in each other's water. And so you hear lots of insults that we throw at each other, a lot of shit talking, and I want to get the shit talking out. So I want to really get into the shit talking, really get into the pooping. So let's all, if everyone could take a breath in and a breath out, and let's connect to the shit talking, okay? This is not necessarily you that have said this, but you've heard it about what do we say, and I want you to yell it out with great emotion, okay? Great emotion. emotion. We're going to talk about right now, what do people say about personal transformation? What's the shit that, other, that the dominant institutional change people who are in that approach and alternative institution, uh, alternative institution and alternative culture, what do they say about personal transformation? Yell it out. Oh, good for you. Not doing to change the system. Great. <laughs> Dropped out of the movement to become an organic farmer. Screw you. Yes. Screw you. <laughs> it be bullshit. It be bullshit. Right? It's elitist. What do other people say? Come on, yell it out. What's that? I couldn't hear that. It's bougie. Bougie. Selfish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You just want your organic food and your little bank, but you don't care about the people. Not my fucking shit. Uh, site. I no, I'm not fucking stay. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I love it. God, that's good. That's good. What? Come on, let's get some shit out there. Are you feeling it, guys? Come on, let's do. What are some other things? <laughs> Capitalists. Mm -hmm. It's not strategic. Not revolutionary, right? Not realistic. Yes. Not um, no. Oh, yeah. The zombies are going to eat you alive in your little hippie commune. The zombies are going to get you because you don't fucking care. Too touchy-feely. Too many emotions. Woo, 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 woo. <laughs> That's exactly what I meant to say. <laughs> <laughs> go meditate someplace else we are down for the revolution here yeah that's all but is there anything is there, are there anything other things before we move to the next one we want to get all the shit out you're appropriating everything mm. oh yeah culturally inter like, like co-opting you're just taking other people's culture and using it for your own your own benefit instead of trying to change it. Not, not engaging with power or like with the world as it is. Mm -hmm. Not building anything. Mm -hmm. Escapist. Oh yeah, escapist. You have no idea how anything works. You have no analysis. No analysis, yeah. Good, that's good. All right, that's a lot of shit. Let's take a deep breath in. And let's take a deep breath out and get all that shit out um, around personal transformation. And, and, but let's get ready to dive back in um, to the alternative institution building. What is the shit that people say? What do people say to the fo about the folks building alternative institutions? 
Yell it out. Paul, I know, I know you got some stuff. So, well, I, I actually, a lot of the same things around personal transformation was said, like That's nasal gaming, spiritual bypassing, you know, all you're doing is just meditating. Just trying to build like a radical clubhouse for my friend. Super exclusive. Rigid personal transformation, right? You just, I mean, all you're trying to do is create a, per, a, a purity culture around your radical ideas. You can't talk to any real people. Self marginalizing up the wazoo. <laughs> You don't want to win. Mm. Ah. America's next top radicals, you just want to be right. Mm. Yep. Yeah, you don't care about being powerful. Yeah, radical basic. I I actually really love that comment. (laughs) I use that quite a bit, actually. Okay, what else? What other shit? Good, good. There's some interplay between personal transformation. A lot of, a lot of that similar shit that that's thrown out. Alternative institutions of personal transformation. Okay, good, 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 good. Now, all, so everyone now, who 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 feels like they participate in personal transformation, alternative institutions in their job, you can just feel all that shit coming in, and you can take a big breath in. Big breath out, big breath in, and big breath out. And now we get to vent that shit at Dominant Institutional Change. Let's. What do you guys say about Dominant Institutional Change? Delusions of sellouts, (laughs) reformists, yes, hacks, moderates. You're You're not down. You're just replicating the same systems of oppression. You're just replicating the same systems of oppression. Higher center of attention. You think Hillary Clinton is an avenue towards meaningful change, and that's all we have to say. You are the problem. Also, no, I have to oh, hi everybody, for my need. Woohoo! Mary, you're taking up too much space. You, you get all the resources, but you don't actually care about the people or their personal transformation. You're burning people out because you, you don't think about what the real alternatives are. What you else? just want media attention. You live in a bubble. You're assholes. You're assholes. You just <laughs> know how to organize. You're manipulative assholes. You're like, you're ruthless and power hungry. You're angry about everything. Your ego is huge. Great. You always take your right. strategic bullshit and throw it on me. Top down white male bull mm. crap. Too many men. Just want to fight, don't want to build anything. Great. Great. Mm-hmm. No one believes that you can do that. Who believes you can change that shit? You're so mainstream. Mm. Great. Great. All right. This is good. This is good. Okay. Not revolutionary radical. You're undermining the radicals. Just okay. need to tear the system down. Boy, revolution, not your bullshit. Okay, let's take a breath in and a breath out. Breath in, breath out. That was really helpful. I actually heard so much of that in my life. Actually, I think that's the predominant way in which most of these different theories of change, when when people are thinking, a lot of times they don't appreciate or understand the different theories. Instead, they're fish, and the only time they come out of the water is if they're shitting in the other fish's water. (laughs) That's that's the only time they they don't really understand. They They just go there to say, 
I'm not you and I don't want to be you and you suck. <laughs> that's, that's my predominant understanding of how uh, social movement ecology happens in the United States and in my experience. Now, there's exceptions to that, but it happens a hell of a lot. Uh, James? Awesome. Yeah, exactly. And so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about why we're using this ecology, um, this, this, this metaphor of ecology. Um, actually, Paul, you, you said something beautiful about it yesterday when we were preparing. So I was wondering if you could, if you could say it again. So the idea of ecology is now very mainstream. But if you think about it, it's actually really complex because instead of studying just one organism and how an organism within an environment is healthy, you realize that in the natural world, organisms are very dependent on other organisms. And those organisms, whether it's the trees or even the microbiotics of the soil and the water and everything interrelate. And even if the organisms not, are not intentionally working together, it creates an entire interrelationship that allows for diversity and health of all the organisms, okay? Ideally, uh, that's what a healthy ecology is. So when we talk about ecology, what are we talking about? We're saying ecology is when different types of organism, and in our case, we're talking about organizations with different approaches, with different theories of change, with different organizational cultures that are fighting for survival. How do they work together, even sometimes unintentionally, sometimes intentionally, to create diversity and create health within a, an ecology? So we're using the metaphor of ecology to talk about social movements. How do it, what's the interchange that allows for the health of everyone to uh, be successful, everyone to create healthy, a healthy ecosystem so that we can help each other? What are the type of relationships? What are the type of exchanges? What is, how do we study that? That's the metaphor. And that's what we want to talk about through, you know, starting this webinar series and doing this training at the end of the year and really beginning a conversation about the need for a healthy movement ecology, the need for different approaches to creating change and creating a, a better relationship. Um, but we also wanted to talk about how you know, it's important because we've done, we've done this a couple of times and sometimes organizations leave the, leave the module thinking, okay, well, let, we're going to create an ecology just within our, our organization. We're going to do all the different theories of change at the same time. And we're not saying that you need to do that either. Um, more power to you if you're able to figure out a model for that. But, but what we think it actually makes more sense for organizations to, to, to really hone in on what is their primary theory of change and not to try to do everything, but to be, make sure that we're in relationship with everything and to appreciate the, the different organizations in our local context, um, in our state, in our national context, and the international context as well, um, and figure out how do we, how do we create more um, complex ways of collaborating across our differences um, you know, and, and, and building higher levels of that collaboration so we can have sharper strategy. Um, and we have this, I, I, Paul, who is this? This is Honey Boo Boo. Who here knows Honey Boo Boo? Come on. I want some explanation points. She's a reality television star, um, and she's trying to juggle, and it's an epic failure here in this image. And that's what we experience a lot of times is if, if we try to force every organization to do everything, a lot of times they'll fail. But if we can acknowledge we need each other, we need each other, we need to appreciate each other, and how can we interact with each other? And a lot of times that's how good a movement ecology emerges within the environment is when people can complement, appreciate each other, not necessarily is it all within the same organization. And trying to do that a lot of times creates lots and lots of tensions. And it also creates some haterism because then you go over and you're expecting people to play each role. And that creates a lot of shit talk. So we're trying to decrease that and instead figure out how do we um, appreciate what we can do and what other people do and how are we in relationship with each other. Exactly. And, and so understanding that we need to support each other, we need those relationships, um, we, need, we need to increase reciprocity. That's what INE stands for. It's what, you know, the work that the R Institute is really engaged in. Um, and, we, and we think that this, that this tool can help us ha have, have some new conversations and build better relationships moving forward. Um, and so we're, you know, this is really at the beginning of the conversation about how do we create a healthy movement ecology.
Um, Paul, is there anything that you wanted to add on this slide? Well, I think that uh, when you see how that, uh, how that emerges within different social movements, and we're going to talk uh, in different countries, they're in, in different um, movements throughout the, the history and in different countries, there has been good at movement ecologies that have existed, even in our own country. And what, when we talk about creating a healthy movement ecology, we're going to use those examples of history and how they happen. But a lot of times it happens because people are in healthy relationship with each other that isn't adversarial and that isn't shit talking is uh, the relationships is where you start is and when you have good relationships and you have bridge figures then a lot of other things can emerge and there can even be a dynamic interplay uh, of complex uh, understandings of how organizations work together but a lot of times that is organizations even if we get into the uh, examples of complex movement ecology, a lot of times it's different organizations that create it together, not within one particular organization. And, but this to me, I tell you, I am super excited because I think this is the key to the revolution. Like in the United States of America, I, re I really feel like most of the time we're not having a discussion of using all the approaches and how the approaches can actually work together. And we're not studying the history of when they do and the dynamic things that happen when we have all the approaches working together. And, and we're not, I, I, there's very few, I'm very rarely in conversations where people are really thinking deeply about how to incorporate uh, a complex movement ecology, how to create that, how to engineer that, how to um, build that into our coalitions or networks or even within our organization. Yeah. And, but the good news is that um, we don't have to start from scratch and we don't have, you know, we're not the only ones, uh, you know, Paul's a super smart guy, um, you know, but uh, you know, this is not the only group of people who are thinking about this kind of stuff. And there's, there's other movements and other models that we can look to um, for insights in other parts of the world. Also here in the U S I think, I think we, we, if we, if we really dove into doing some research we, we could really analyze um, different models that have emerged uh, for, for building relationships across these, these different theories of change and approaches Two of the ones we wanted to highlight right now. Um, I'm going to talk a little just briefly about a movement in Brazil called moving to landless workers, the MST. Um, they have been, they've been able to really bring together many different approaches. They have people who are growing food and produce and growing and selling food and, and through co-ops and feeding each other. Um, they've created, you know, through that an alternative economic system. They also have alternative education systems, which have also now actually, um, replace the state education systems in some way. So they've moved from being alternative to being actually the dominant institution in the, in those areas where they're really strong. Um, and they've, they launched popular movements. They, they, you know, their, their own movement and their own struggles, but they also have helped seed other movements in the country. Um, and, and they were an instrumental part in building the, the workers party, which was recently ousted from power through a, an undemocratic coup in Brazil. Um, and so there's a lot of, a lot of complexity within, within their ecology. And it's not all, you know, not to say that it's all easy. I mean, this, they've been going for 30 years and there's a lot of tension between these different approaches and, and, and it has to be negotiation and power sharing and figuring out wh where to move resources and what to prioritize. But they've been able to figure out a model for doing that. And it's really helped them grow. They have over 2 million people that are part of their movement now. Um, and we, uh, Paul, do you want to say anything more about the MST or talk a little about the Indian National Congress? Well, I, I think that uh, it's, it's, uh, MST is a beautiful example in the complexity. Now, they, they still have separate organizations that focus on a primary theory of change, but they all work together. And because of that, there's amazing collaboration that happens between those approaches. And uh, I heard from Ariel that there's lots of talks about how alternative institutions can directly support dominant institutional work. In some movements, they are. I think in the environmental movement, there is a better conversation about that than a lot of other movements. Um, that's a good example. We're going to brainstorm after this about where people see there being good movement ecology. Um, but I just want to uh, call out uh, Chris. Chris is writing a book right now that really talks about Gandhi and how Gandhi, um, from my understanding, Chris, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think he's talking about how amazing the Indian National Congress and Satnagraha and self-purification ashrams, all these different wings of the movement that Gandhi was a huge bridge figure and a leader in creating these different organizations that each had different approaches that worked together so that when there was a mass protest movement, it was the ashrams and people doing constructive work 
to improve people's lives personally that allowed people to participate like the weavers collective that was part of the constructive program the personal transformation changing were the shock troops of the nonviolent army that was uh, gandhi called satnagraha which was the wing of the movement that did mass protest movements and the indian national congress was this al alternative political institution which was the later on took over the government but they and, and would mobilize people to the mass protest movement and actually also the the politicians gandhi really gandhi and a lot of other leaders made it so the politicians would wear khadi cloth they would speak in hindi they would do a lot of things so that they didn't isolate themselves uh or replicate the dominant institution of colonialism um so there was a, an amazing interplay that allowed millions of people to participate in the movement in a dynamic way in India and so, since this day, I think there's very uh, the complexity of that and the model of that is still like a beacon for all of us that want to create a revolutionary movement. Um, so studying that movement is very helpful. Yeah, but what are some other uh, other other examples that you can think of? Are there, are there anything that anything that come to your mind? Um, just take a, take a moment to, to start writing in the chat box. Um, I've heard a little bit about these two examples, but there, you know, there, there's contemporary models, you know, that we can talk about. People are trying to ha have these conversations, trying to innovate in these ways. There's also maybe examples from the past where people have put it together. I think, um, you know, one that, that I personally, you know, see, you know, a, an organization that was trying to weave together different uh, theories of change, you know, and, and, and the, it was the Black Panther Party um, with varying degrees of success. And there's a lot of uh, debate about how um, you know how bringing together services and um, education and all and, and, and challenging dominant institutions through electoral work and, and 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 other means you know how that actually worked what you know what, what was successful for them but what are some uh, some, th some things that are coming to y'all if any um, is, Paul is anything coming through the chat box so uh, Sophie said that during the 60s there was an inter interesting movement ecology between an the anti-war movement and the counterculture that was flourishing in the late 60s. Mm -hmm. um, so what are some other things? The Zapatistas had an interesting, they, they create these autonomous zones with, with uh, a whole parallel school system and whatnot. Chris, you know, if, if you wanna say anything, you know, maybe in the chat box or even, I think it would be interesting to hear your uh response hello to democracy spring movement house i think that the movement house Yay. one one example of trying to create alternative little movement community that is also uh you know training organizers occupy had all three theories of chain present in the encampments not always did they work together very well but there <laughs> definitely was people who are fighting for all three mm -hmm. changes and were showing up to occupy based on the three the three different major theories of change. Mm -hmm. um, so there was people that were building alternative institutions and decision making like the general assemblies and the book uh, library and food and clinics. And there was people that were doing personal transformation work like yoga and therapy and stuff and providing services to people. And there was people that were trying to use it to change dominant institutions. Um, so the religious right is a very good example. A lot of the religious right is doing primarily personal transformation and mutual aid groups, um, but they're also trying to create a counterculture. For them, it's a, like a conservative counterculture, and they also are, um, they, they mobilize uh, politically, they one of the most important and influential voting blocks. I'm not saying they're a good uh, force for social change, but they certainly are a powerful one. Um, Currently in Rio, there's diverse groups such as Fishermen's Union, Feminist Organization, uh, Racial Justice Orgs coming together to protest the negative effects of uh, uh, the Olympics and poor handling by the government. Great example, great example. Quakers, I think throughout American history, the Quakers were um, uh, uh, religious minority uh, that were very countercultural and had Quaker houses and did a lot of services for the poor and for the mentally ill, but then also became leaders in the anti abolitionist and, and uh, ab the uh, women's suffrage movement. They were some of the biggest leaders came out of that counterculture. And there was an interesting play between the Quaker counterculture and the peace churches and the major movements in the United States of America. So, all these are great examples of complex movement ecology. 
All right, awesome. And so, yeah, like this is going to be part of a process of building a movement ecology model today in the U.S. Um, and having a complex conversation across a lot of different approaches and theories of change. And so we thank you for joining us um, tonight. And um, we're excited to, you know, finish this webinar series or we'll continue it uh, and, and the second webinar that we'll have next week and we'll hope you all will join us for that. Um, but when we'll try to have more webinars throughout the rest of this year. We'll have this training and, and really try to launch this conversation um, over this next year and so, so we can get this pretty, pretty in depth in, into the complexities. Uh, but we wanted to stop now just to, we've got, it's 7.50, um, so we wanna take just a few more minutes um, just to like, you know, harvest some uh, key insights and major questions that people are gonna be taking with them. Um, and so if you could just like, uh, I, don't, I don't know if we want to unmute right now or just in the chat box. Um, just, you know, take a moment to think and write down like what, what was a key insight that came to you through this webinar? Um, uh, you know, what do you, what, what, something you're going to still be thinking about or be sharing with other people tomorrow. Um, and what's a major question that you might bring back with you next week or that you, you might have, you know, in your organizations or, or just be wrestling with for some time. Take a moment, think about it. Um, Write them down in the chat box, I guess, and uh, and then we'll, we'll start harvesting those. Uh, Can we? So do let's that? let's take a breath in. Okay, cool. Take a breath out. Breath in. Breath out. And let's really get grounded in one insight that came up for us. What is an insight? that or appreciate something that we appreciated that we learned from this webinar and also maybe a question. And the first one I just want to say is like the big question for me is like, Oh my God, what is the potential of building? If I were the king of the world, if our movement was the king of the world, it, what, how would we engineer? Uh, in my tradition as liberation theology, the kingdom of God, what if our movement really took over the dominant institutions? How would we construct a movement ecology? And just thinking right now, we're just building relationships, but if we really had the power, how could we work together? What is all the complex ways we can work together? And just say, hmm, everyone could do it with me. Go, hmm, that is really interesting. There's lots of possibilities and lots of models. Everyone go, hmm, I want to hear it. I want to hear it. I'm eavesdropping. Everyone go, hmm, mm. the power, the power. I think people are still muted. Okay. Mm. So now, <laughs> good, good. That was good, Victoria. That was good bodily. Okay. So, um, so we have some things. Movement ecology, this is one of the insights. Movement ecology works when we can identify one theory of change from our org and be in relationships with other. Um, that's great. I think that that understanding that there isn't one theory of change, but that there's many and that we can appreciate that there's strengths and weaknesses to each one. Um, and it's not just there is one key that we need all approaches. How to support. Uh, so another thing, the appreciation was that there is lots of tensions within each of these and throughout social movement history there's tons of tension um, and it's exciting to jump into what are the tensions between these different types uh, uh, i don't need to do everything thank god i don't need to do everything it's a lot of pressure off of me uh, is respect so Prentice is saying, comes to mind as respect that we lack it and we don't gain it. We alienate our say from moving forward together. We don't have, when we don't have respect or appreciation or understanding, there's no way to build a relationship and there's no way to collaborate. Mm -hmm. um, I've been guilty of that too. As I was a very rigid, when I first started organizing, I was a countercultural dude and I crapped on everyone else's water and I couldn't work with them. And then when I became a hardcore community organizer, I crapped in everyone else's water and never able to build relationships. And, you know, um, 
So yes, for respect. So now we're going to do some questions that people are, we're not going to answer the questions, but I think it's really good to leave us with these things. How do we overcome our differences and resolve conflicts? How do we support people to recognize that they don't need to do everything and are more effective when they choose one theory of change? Um, and then relate to other theories of change, but not have to do everything. Uh, what comes to mind, uh, how do we distinguish between doing coalition building, theories of change, working together, and our core purpose, one theory of change? Mm -hmm. That is a really good question. We're going to talk a little bit about that in advanced social movement ecology, is how do we, what are, thinking about what are models for doing movement ecology? Co traditional coalition building is one way in which people think about it. Um, there's a lot of different ways in which people go about trying to create networks and movement ecology. And we're going to talk a little bit more in next webinar. Everyone give me, give me the, the explanation point. If you're excited to learn what are some different models of doing it. Woohoo. Okay. Does it make sense to brand the movement ecology under an umbrella that holds all three or to leave it unnamed? Very question. Do you have a meta brand? Like in MST, there's a meta brand or in the movement in the Gandhian uh, you know, independence movement or the, the Indian independence movement, there was like a brand. Uh, they had actually a spinning wheel and that was the brand of the entire movement. And, and so that's a really interesting question. Um, and we have some also some some appreciations for the facilitators for making this webinar accessible. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, like which way is more successful? Well, you know what? A lot of times people get frustrated with us because what we say is we give you models, but we don't say necessarily which one should be used in your context. We give you a lot of theory. We give you a lot of distinctions. We give you a lot of models. And we give you um, a lot of historical sort of examples. But in the end, a lot of times we do not answer all your questions because we can't answer them. The hardest part is translation. It's taking the theory and the models and the practices and applying it to your movement. And that's what takes almost all the energy and, um, to make it work. Uh, and we can't do that. That's why we need you. And if you create m better models of social movement ecology, it helps all of us. We need you. We can't do this alone. We, we need you and we need your examples and experience to apply these theories, these models, these practices into your own work and then to teach us how in the hell to do this thing. Because we really, this is the beginning of a conversation. We're not saying we have not done this in the United States of America. In some ways, we think that the first step to doing this, if you talk about the next, if you could do the next slide, James, really advanced movement ecology and this whole practice is like we want to build a more vibrant movement ecology in the United States of America. How in the hell do we do this? And Carlos Saavedra, who is one of the founders of the ID Institute, he says, you always start with the training. You know, you need to get people into a similar vocabulary and introduce them and, and to be in dialogue and participate and be in a liminal space where we can start understanding and appreciate each other before we can, a lot of times that helps build relationships and the relationships are the building blocks of whatever you want to do, whether it's building a new organization or building a coalition or a network or whatever, the building block is first common vocabulary, understanding, appreciation, and relationships. So really, but we're going to advance movement ecology. We're going to start talking about what are the major barriers that we have for actually doing even relationship building. Um, what and advanced movement ecology also, we're going to, we're going to talk about distinctions within changing dominant institutions, because as you realize, there is a fight between different people who are trying to change the dominant institution. Some people are trying to work inside the system. Some people are trying to work outside the system. Some people are mass protest people. Some people are community organizers. And a lot of times there's tons of tension even within that theory of change. So in advanced movement ecology, we're going to be talking about that. So uh, Sarah said these, are, these, these shared frameworks are very helpful. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. I'm excited. This, this to me, having lots of people on the same language to talk and expand this is going to make this such an amazing experience for me and for our movements. And I've already seen that uh, momentum training has created a common vocabulary around 
uh, mass protest movements and um, structure organizations. That, that's what we call those two traditions. And now I see so much dialogue uh, because of that training. And I'm so excited to do that now in a much wider way with artists, with people who are working inside the system, with lots of people. Because I believe that we can't do it the way we've been doing it. We have to think radically different about how to create social change. And that's gonna happen because we, we take seriously social movement ecology. And I really wish I would have had this when I was a labor organizer or community organizer. I really wish I, st I could start thinking outside of the box and I could have started appreciating understanding different models of doing it uh, and different approaches and, and not go through what James so eloquently explained in his personal story of just having that rigid divide that we can be in dialogue and start thinking creatively about things happening. So I want to thank everyone for participating in this. It, it became much more dynamic, even if it's, if it's limited on a webinar, just getting your, your, your comments in the chat box were really helpful. And I think we're gonna harvest uh, a lot of the comments that you made and incorporate them in because I think there was so much good stuff that came up. Yep, and with that, it is 8.01, um, so we're going to end now, and we thank everyone for coming out. I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen so I can actually see y'all, and um, hey, look at that, so many beautiful people, um, and yeah, thank you all um, for joining us. Uh, it's exciting to see so many exclamation points, and finally getting to see the chat box, that's beautiful. Um, we'll be back same time next week, uh, invite a friend, um, yep. Appreciate y'all. Have a great night. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I think that went great. I think it was good, man. I think it was real solid. I, I, think, I think you're still recording. Oh, crap. I am still recording. Cut it off. Cut